Will you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Holy God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Small. Spork. Turducken. Brangelina. These words are all portmanteau, words that blend the sounds and meanings of two words into one. Portmanteau words are fun, and many of them funny, but they also help us to name things that are two or more in one. My spouse Bales and I have a portmanteau that we've made up, and this word describes the state of being so hungry that you're likely to act cranky or get angry for no good reason. We call this combination of hungry, cranky, and angry, frankry. <laughs> Frank Green, H-R-A-N-K-G-R-Y, as in, I forgot to have lunch before church, so I got Frank Green during the sermon. <laughs> I was struggling a bit to write this sermon earlier this week. I just had the worst writer's block. And when I told Bales about it, he said, did you eat a good breakfast? You always get writer's block when you're Frank Green. <laughs> And the next morning after I ate a good breakfast, the ideas finally started coming together. As I wrote, I marveled at my own foolishness. I had forgotten that my mind and body are connected. Even as I studied Paul's words about the connections between body and soul. Today's epistle reading from 1 Corinthians is famous among biblical scholars for being confusing and obscure. We just heard it in the King James Version, which was beautiful, full of language, but it may have added another layer of obscurity. So I'm going to now read it in a more modern version, the NRSV. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that, you are, that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or... Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That is still pretty confusing. <laughs> not only confusing, but a little troubling, especially to me, the part about prostitutes, Paul sounds so horrified and disgusted by prostitutes, revolted at the idea of connecting a prostitute to the body of Christ. It's hard to imagine Jesus sharing that revulsion exactly. Jesus, who ate with sinners and tax collectors. Jesus, whose feet were washed with the tears of a sinful woman and dried with her hair. I have no doubt that every child of God can be welcomed joyfully into the body of Christ. 
no doubt. <coughs> but I think there's something important in this lesson, nonetheless. When we study the epistles, it is important to remember that we are, in effect, reading someone else's mail. <coughs> in the early days of the church, people like Paul and Peter traveled the known world, spreading the good news and starting Christian communities. They would form really close relationships with these people in these new churches, but eventually they'd move on, and so they would keep in touch by correspondence. And many of their letters were kept and copied and shared, and those letters are the epistles in our Bible today. One reason that this passage is confusing is that we have walked into the middle of a conversation, and we are only hearing one side of that conversation, a letter from Paul that responds to questions and concerns in a letter from the church in Corinth. We can tell from Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians, that he has just read a lot of bad news about how the Corinthian Christians have been behaving. The book of 1 Corinthians opens with Paul sternly chastising the Corinthian church for their infighting and their divisions and their factions. And soon after that, he is scolding them for sexual immorality. And shortly after that, he's yelling at them for the way they are conducting communion. Some people are getting er coming early, getting drunk, and eating all the food. <laughs> and for all of their bad behavior, these are the saints who are in And it was famous for its, let's say, rowdy nightlife. So famous that in the Roman Empire, getting drunk and acting lewd had its own made-up word, Corinthianizing. The Corinthians, living in this city famous for its licentiousness, hear the gospel of a god of grace, and they convert, and then some of them start to think to themselves, hey, we're all set. God is a God of grace, and our sins have been redeemed, and that means we can behave however we like. Party time. The passage we heard today is Paul's answer. First, he quotes back what they wrote to him. These quotation marks are not in the King James Version. Quote, everything is lawful. Then he responds, but not everything is beneficial. He quotes it again. Everything is law. And he responds again, but I will not be dominated by anything. That is, nothing but God should have power over me. Again, he quotes the Corinthians. This is them. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. The Corinthians are advocating satisfying the appetites of the body. Only souls matter, they think. So why not just do what feels good? But Paul says no. The body is not meant for fornication, he says. The word he uses there is porneia, the word from which we get the word pornography. It is really not clear what Paul meant by porneia. In popular usage in Greek, it meant some kind of sexual immorality, but we can't quite figure it out. There's not a lot of instances um, it might be general, it might be specific. If it's specific, it might be prostitution, it might be adultery, or since Paul grew up Jewish, he was schooled in the Old Testament, and he may be using the word in part or in whole, metaphorically in this case, because in the Old Testament, uh, the prophets and the, and the Torah, when they spoke of the Israelites' unfaithfulness and idolatry, they would speak of it in terms of adultery or prostitution. Scholars have spilled gallons of ink trying to figure this out. Most of them are trying to push one agenda or another. I can't tell you what it means for sure. But I think we might get somewhere if we move on to what Paul says next. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Part of the Corinthians' mistake is that they imagine that the soul and body are entirely separate things. They can do what they want with the body, they think, because it's merely a vehicle for the soul. That idea was actually prevalent in Greek philosophy. Uh, 
Platonist philosophy in particular, which tended to believe that the soul was eternal, good, and unchangeable, while the body was temporary, changeable, basically bad. In the Republic, Plato wrote that we are at our purest and most virtuous when we are least connected to our bodies. Platonist philosophy sees bodies as not much more than gross, stinky houses made of meat, in which our souls are unfortunately imprisoned. Paul says a resounding no to the idea that bodies are an inconvenient, irrelevant coincidence. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. God created bodies. God came to us in a body. And the crucified Christ was resurrected in a body. Bodies matter to God, Paul declares. They are not only temporary houses for eternal souls. The psalm today points us toward a more faithful way of thinking about human bodies. It speaks of a God who knows us body and soul, knitting us together in the womb. It proclaims that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. This is the tradition from which Paul speaks when he declares to the Corinthians, that how we use our bodies matters profoundly. This weekend, we remember the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. While he was in prison for his work, Dr. King wrote one of his greatest pieces of writing, the letter from a Birmingham jail. In this letter, Dr. King spoke out against complacent churches, which he writes, commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strange, unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between the sacred and the secular. The legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. reminds us that injustice perpetrated against bodies, that's how it's usually perpetrated, has deep effects on the souls of the oppressed and the oppressor alike. Because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, there are intricate links between our physical bodies and our internal lives, links that we feel in big ways and in small. When our minds are troubled, we feel it in our bodies, in headaches or sore backs. Hunger can make us cranky. A time of prayer can relax our shoulders. A brisk walk can lift our spirits. An hour of yoga can help us feel a deep sense of spiritual peace. We shape our relationships through physical touch. From handshakes and hugs during the passing of the peace to lovers embracing. As a mother and an infant fall asleep together, their heart rates synchronize. The body is more than a place where the soul lives. Our inner and outer selves are deeply connected. It's how we're made. And so what we do with our bodies, honoring or harming them, using them to honor or to harm, does matter. It's true, Paul acknowledges, that everything is lawful. That is to say, our God is a God of grace, who comes to us despite every sin, flaw, or shortcoming. There is no rule book we have to play by in order to earn God's love. God's love is not quid pro quo, it is freely given to us no matter what. Paul urges the Corinthians to see this surpassing grace, not as an excuse for doing harm, but as an encouragement toward deeper faithfulness. He urges us to glorify God by honoring God's creation, our bodies, and, I would add, not only our bodies, but also the bodies of others. Paul's words to the Corinthians
women's focus on sexual intimacy as a way that we can either glorify God or do harm. I don't know what Paul means by pornea, but I do believe that God delights in expressions of sexuality that are loving and honest and mutual and respectful. And I do believe that God does not delight in expressions of sexuality that harm or oppress or objectify. But the words, everything is lawful but not everything is beneficial, have implications far beyond sexuality. What would it mean to try to delight God through how we eat, or how we use our time, or how we spend our money? The Iona community is a community of Christians in Scotland. You might recognize their name from our time of evening prayer that we have been doing every week for uh, many weeks now. Members of that community make a commitment to one another to be mutually accountable for how they spend their money. Periodically, they gather with their checkbooks and their bank statements, and they discuss whether their financial decisions, not just their decision to pledge or not pledge, how much, and before or after tax, not just that, their financial decisions as a whole, are they, these decisions reflections of their Christian faith. Are they spending more money on luxuries or on feeding the hungry? Does their use of money reflect their commitment to caring for the earth? Do they avoid supporting corporations that use slave labor? Would God take delight in the ways they spend money? God will love us if we squander every cent of our money on fancy gadgets and expensive clothing. That's the message of the prodigal son part of it, anyway. Everything is lawful. But not everything is beneficial. Thoughtful, faithful use of the blessings we have from God deepens our faith and delights God's we are not just souls housed inside of bodies, Paul says. We are portmanteau people. Our souls and our bodies are blended and bound up and knitted together. When our souls are well, we can feel it in our bodies. Honoring bodies can buoy up our souls. Our God is a God of grace. There is nothing we can do, body or soul, that will separate us from the love of God. But Paul invites us to go deeper than that, to remember that bodies matter, to remember that we are created by God fearfully and wonderfully <coughs> made. We are invited to respond to God's love with everything we have, with our hands and our feet and our minds and our hearts and our voices, with our time and our money and our skills and our words and our actions. We won't live perfectly today, probably not tomorrow either. And that's fine, because nothing can separate us from the love of God, who came to us in Christ, who loves us beyond our wildest dreams, and who has created us fearfully and wonderfully. Thanks be to God.